Hello, and welcome to A Theory of Everything. I'm Luis Razo, the director of ASIM and host of this channel. Today, we're talking to one of the most widely respected theoretical physicists in the world, Professor Paul Davies, who was born and raised in England, but is currently the Regents Professor of Physics at Arizona State University and director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science. In addition, he's affiliated with the Institute of Quantum Studies at Chapman University, which is near my hometown in California, and has taught several of the world's top uh, universities, including the University of Cambridge and King's College London. Among his many accolades are the 1995 Templeton Prize and the 2002 Faraday Prize from the Royal Society. And he also has an asteroid uh, named after him. He's written hundreds of research papers across an impressive range of scientific fields and has published more than 30 books, including his most recent, What's Eating the Universe, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Professor Davies, congratulations on your stellar career. And thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Oh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction, and I'm always happy to talk about the things that interest me. Well, it's an honor to have you. I have to say that I've admired your work for, from afar for so many years, and you strike me as one of the most uh, intelligent, transparent, and noble thinkers in the world. So I, I can't stress enough how grateful I am for your time. So with, with your permission, I'd like to open by saying a couple of things about what I hope to accomplish in our short time together. So my, my overall goal is to try to connect your book, What's Eating the Universe, to the question of what's eating Europe, and in particular, what's eating Ukraine at the moment. I suppose it might seem like uh, pretty absurd to try to make this connection, but I think it's a critically important one uh, apart from the horrors that the people of Ukraine are experiencing at the moment, uh, humanity as in general, we're literally on the verge of World War III, which is likely to be nuclear. Against this background, I feel obligated to respectfully hold your feet to the fire in a sense, and see if we can't draw out some implications of your work for the critical question of how we're going to avoid destroying ourselves as a species. It's obviously not gonna do anybody any good to figure out everything there is to know in physics to arrive at a so-called theory of everything, which even explains how life and consciousness arose, but we can't figure out how to keep from destroying ourselves. So I think we can make progress along these lines in three different ways. So what I have in mind for this talk is first to talk about your book, what's even the universe, kind of contextualize it and uh, historically and anthropologically where we are in terms of uh, our evolution as a species and where we are in terms of space time in general. And then I'd like to talk about interpretation, the role of interpretation in physics. And the third concept I'd like to be clear about is symmetry and the role that symmetry has played in physics. So with that, I can proceed to my first question. I see that your book, uh, What's Eating the Universe as a concise summary of our current state of understanding of nature. So to take a big picture view of this, space-time as we know it, it was born about 14 billion years ago. At some point, the stars formed, then our sun, then the earth, then life, then humans arose, then several thousand years ago, religion and civilization arose, the Greeks, the Romans, then about 500 years ago, the scientific revolution, and then about 100 years ago, quantum mechanics and general relativity. Now we're in 2022, we're on the verge of possibly, unfortunately, destroying ourselves. And at this point, your book has emerged. Is that 
kind of sweep through history about right. Uh, what would you add or change to that? And where does your book fit into this, into this, um, uh, into this narrative? Well, of course, I embarked on writing the book uh, before the current uh, war in Ukraine. Although uh, just after I had uh, visited Ukraine, I spent a week there in the middle of uh, 2019. So it was before the pandemic hit. Uh, I uh, visited uh, Lviv, uh, Kiev, and Odessa. Uh, ev everything seemed uh, completely normal and just like any other European country, though one of my colleagues in Phoenix said, be sure to leave before the Russians arrive. So I think uh, many of us did fear that this was going to happen. Uh, and in terms of relating it to the book, well, of course, now this is a, a bit of a stretch, but, we, but if I can paint a, a really big picture, there are really two uh, conflicting views about the nature of the universe. Uh, one is that it's getting better and better. The other is that it's getting worse and worse. Uh, so for a hundred years, our understanding of cosmology was dominated by the second law of thermodynamics. That's the law that says, uh, left to itself, everything naturally degenerates and runs down and the universe is no exception. And although it may endure for billions or trillions of years, uh, at the end, uh, things will sort of uh, grind to a halt and interesting activity will cease. But set against that, when we look back at the Big Bang, at the condition of the universe in the early stages after the Big Bang, it was really extraordinarily simple and bland. Uh, and the complexity that we see all around us from galaxies, galactic structure, stars, planets, uh, and, and life, and all of these things have emerged since. And so alongside this degenerative arrow of time, this running down of things, we see um, something, an arrow going in the opposite direction, a buildup of complexity and richness and diversity. And of course, we like to position human life as part of that uh, a positive arrow, that is that, um, that life on Earth began simple, it's evolved to greater complexity, and that the emergence of life and mind and beings who can not just observe the world but comprehend it uh, as part of this sort of uh, upward directionality. Now that's a romantic view because there's no scientific theory that says the universe has to get more complex or that life has to evolve greater complexity. Uh, there's nothing that we know uh, that says that, but we can make that observation. And it, it may be one of these things like a glass half full or half empty. It depends which aspect of this you stress. Uh, because you don't get complexity for free every time new species evolve with more capabilities. There's a, a price to be paid in entropy in the surroundings. Um, so uh, we see the, the interplay of these two. And the question I think a lot of people want to know is when we look at human life, are we on the cusp of um, unleashing something uh, uh, even better than ourselves? Is it, uh, can we look to, to a future in which things like warfare um, are just uh, abolished as infantile absurdities? And, uh, and could it be that by handing over to artificial intelligence, we will have a more balanced and hopeful future? So that's one sort of utopian vision. And the other is that, um, that human beings, human society will just succumb to this uh, all pervasive second law of thermodynamics and our civilization will collapse like all previous civilizations and our species will eventually become extinct. And that's it. Uh, intelligent life might be snuffed out. And, it, and for all we know, we're the only intelligent beings in the entire universe. We don't know that one way or the other. Uh, and so it could be that this is the universe's only experiment with advanced intelligence and with comprehensibility with beings who can come to understand the universe. And I don't know which of those is correct because we have no evidence, uh, first of all, for this uh, upward directional arrow and no evidence for any life beyond Earth, let alone intelligent life. Of course, as a human being, I would love to believe that we live in a universe that is getting better and better and that our, our current woes are just a speed bump on the road 
uh, to greater and greater things. But but I, I, I have only my r romantic nature, uh, uh, my positive outlook, uh, and and a mistake now uh, in the current inter international situation could be catastrophic. And we just have to hope that there is some sort of inherent wisdom that pervades the planet that means no one individual can doom us all. Uh, and, uh, and, and I believe that is in fact the case. So I'm going to take the positive view that we will get through this dark time. Uh, though I never expected to see another war in Europe which uh, looks from all its features like a recapitulation of uh, World War II. Uh, something which I've studied in great detail, and we all thought that that type of um, uh, the, the the type of conflict where one country thinks, well, I think I'll grab another because it's going to be good for me, that 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 was all over, um, and uh, uh, and so this looks like an anachronism to me. I can see uh, events very similar to those in the 1930s, uh, which is chilling. Yes, agreed. Do you think that, well, it's one thing to have a positive outlook and to have hope. It's quite another to draw a specific plan for how to, um, how to make sure that we're not destroyed. Uh, would you agree? Uh, well, of course, uh, well, uh, I, I, in fact, not only would I agree, of, of course we need a plan, but I am, um, uh, to be perfectly honest, astounded that humanity is able to organize itself uh, even at the level of nation states. So let me just say something about that. that um, our uh, species evolved um, to, to develop various social skills. And these uh, developed maybe 100,000 years ago uh, in small groups of people, small tribes, hunter-gatherer uh, groups, uh, typically of 100 or 200 individuals. Uh, and it's telling that we can only remember the names of about uh, 150 people because our brains are really tuned to forming um, tribal groups on that scale. And so then it comes as something of a surprise that we can organize ourselves reasonably coherently on a scale of, you know, maybe 100 million individuals, uh, maybe even 1 billion individuals. And I know of no law of sociology or anything like that that says that that uh, level of organization is inevitable or successful. So I think it's already pretty remarkable that we can do that. But what we can't seem to do uh, is to advance that to a global scale. So after World War II, uh, luminaries like Albert Einstein uh, really wanted to develop some sort of world government. They felt that the planet as a whole could have some sort of collective organization. Um, that hasn't happened uh, politically. It's happened economically. What we've seen is the, uh, the integration of, uh, of trade and uh, information flow and the very fact that we're talking now across the Atlantic uh, without any difficulty uh, shows uh, that um, there has been a type of integration, but evidently it's not strong enough to have withstood the forces of disintegration uh, which are afflicting Europe and other parts of the world. We mustn't forget that this uh, disaster in Europe um, seems all the more real to me because I'm familiar with those countries. Uh, but there are other parts of the world that have suffered uh, similarly and uh, there may be others yet to come. So we, we can't seem to somehow uh, carry that um, remarkable level of coherence and organization and understanding to the, to the level it would require to secure the future of this planet. So we, we still live in a perilous time. Exactly. And do you think that there is a parallel or a symmetry between what's eating Europe and what's eating the universe? <laughs> well, um, uh, the, the, t the title of my book draws upon one uh, particular chapter. As you mentioned in your opening. Uh, the, the book is really a snapshot of uh, the triumphs of the subject of cosmology, but also the unanswered questions. It ha has the subtitle and other cosmic questions. Now, I've lived through this golden age of cosmology. It really began in earnest uh, when 
the satellite called COBE, Cosmic Background Explorer, which was sent up to map the fading afterglow of the Big Bang, the heat radiation left over from the beginning, uh, re returned its results. And it was very clear uh, that buried in that uh, cosmic background radiation would be essential clues to how the universe began. And by mapping that, that background radiation to extraordinary precision with subsequent satellites, uh, there's one up there at the moment, the European satellite called Planck, uh, it, cosmology has become a precision science. It wasn't that way when I was a student. Uh, people would quip, well, there's speculation, then there's speculation squared, and then there's cosmology. About the only thing we knew for certain is that the universe is expanding, and that was discovered a um, uh, hundred years ago. Uh, and, and some people would say that's the founding of the subject of modern cosmology. But I think really it began as a precision science uh, around about 1990 with this uh, mapping of the cosmic microwave background. And so the, the title of the book refers to the fact that uh, when uh, we ask ourselves, well, how did the universe come to exist? Uh, did it uh, burst into existence from literally nothing? No space, no time, no matter or energy. Um, whatever your position on that, there's general agreement that it was a quantum process. The quantum effects uh, were responsible and they will have left their imprint in the nature of the universe. And uh, anyone listening to us would, if they know anything at all about quantum mechanics, they'll know that it's got two features. One is it's all about uncertainty uh, and unpredictability. And uh, the other is it uh, applies to little things. And they may be surprised to hear me using uh, the notion of quantum effects in connection with cosmology, because the universe is very big. But of course, if we believe the Big Bang Theory and take it seriously, when you run the great cosmic movie backward, there would have been a time when everything was very compressed to atomic dimensions, and quantum effects would have been important. Now, the theory that was applied to the Big Bang back in the 1970s and 80s uh, predicted that there would be a certain pattern of variation or fluctuation in this background heat radiation uh, to a few parts in a million. And sure enough, that's what is detected. And so uh, this tells us that the universe was born in a state of almost uh, perfect uniformity. But without those slight variations in the background heat, which represent slight variations in the density of matter in the universe, it would never have formed galaxies and stars and, and so on. So our very existence depends upon that slight departure from uniformity. Now, the results of applying quantum physics to the Big Bang match extraordinarily well these observations, but not absolutely perfectly. There are one or two anomalies on the largest scale of size, and these have become increasingly puzzling over the last decade or so. Uh, and one of these, uh, which is where I get the title of the book from, uh, is that there is a big cold patch in the southern hemisphere. Um, it's, when I say big, um, even uh, to, from our perspective, it's, it's bigger than the size of the full moon. And so it's a, it's a big part of the universe, and it's almost as if a cosmic giant has taken a bite out of it. Um, it's a, like a super void. Nobody really knows what has caused this. Uh, that is, you know, what, it, what is, is something actually eating that part of the universe? Is it a neighboring universe that sort of bumped into ours? Is it a blemish left over from the birth pangs of the universe because it wasn't as smooth and um, uh, quantum driven as I have uh, suggested? Is there some other explanation? We don't know. Um, but it's, it's one example of how there's unfinished business in cosmology. It's not a done deal. There are things that we need to explain. And of course, when, when you get that happening in any science, uh, there's always this uh, dichotomy. Uh, is this just a little bit of tweaking of some of the parameters and all will fall into place? Or does this mismatch presage uh, a collapse of the entire paradigm? Are we on the verge of a, a new revolution in science, particularly in physics and cosmology, uh, in order to explain these things? Is it just a little chink 
in the armor of our fantastic theories that we have at the moment. Okay, great. Well, am I correct to, to say that cause and effect as we understand it today um, indicates that however we interpret those, those early signals that we receive from the cosmic micro, microwave background, there is a causal connection to everything that we experience today. Is that not the case? Um, well, this uh, question of causality uh, is a very difficult one because in daily life, uh, we have no difficulty in assigning cause and effect. Uh, you can say, well, why is the window broken? Well, somebody threw a brick at it. Uh, that seems pretty clear cut. When you get down to the quantum level, the atomic and molecular level, um, you can't really use uh, that, that sort of language. It doesn't apply. What you've got is interactions between subatomic particles and, uh, and uh, molecules and, and so forth. Uh, and, and those interactions mean that the uh, components of the universe are linked together. Uh, but uh, causation is not, uh, not something which really emerges until you get to the sort of everyday life, the, ma the macroscopic world. Um, and people always want to apply causation even in terms of the Big Bang. They want to say, what caused the Big Bang? Um, what made the Big Bang go bang? Uh, and they would like there to be something before it which would cause it. But um, uh, it maybe we just have to give up on that type of uh, explanation. We, we can say, well, why did the Big Bang happen? That's, that's fair enough. Um, uh, you know, this, we, we can't just sort of say, well, it did. Um, uh, and that's fair enough. But uh, if the Big Bang was the origin of space and time, uh, then any talk of what came before or what caused the Big Bang uh, is really inappropriate. Now, we don't know that. It's fashionable at the moment uh, to say that the universe is, uh, at what we see, uh, our universe is nothing of the sort. It's just a, a microcosm in some infinite system, which we call the multiverse, in which there are many bangs and many universes scattered throughout space and time, uh, and that the entire assemblage of universes is, is eternal, has no, no beginning or no end. And so um, uh, set against that backdrop, uh, the categories of thought that we have, uh, like cause and effect, really have to be modified. We have to have a different view of the nature of reality. That's fantastic. I think there's a perfect point to uh, turn to the next uh, concept that I'd like to talk about, which is interpretation in physics. And for this, if you allow me, I'd like to play a short clip, uh, 50 seconds from Richard Feynman. And then I'd like to ask you about your work on boundary conditions and interpretations of quantum mechanics. Of special interest is your work with um, the work Yaki of Yakir Aharonov, yes, that's fascinating, fascinating stuff. So speaking of cause and effect and understanding causality, it seems uh, super, super interesting. So allow me to play this quick clip. Suppose you have two theories, A and B, which look completely different psychologically, different ideas in them and so on, but that all the consequences that are computed all the consequences of the computed are exactly the same. Suppose we have two such theories, how are we going to decide which one is right? No way, not by science. However, for psychological reasons, in order to get new theories, these two things are very far from equivalent. Because one gives a man different ideas than the other. By putting the theory in a certain kind of framework, you get an idea what to change. And every theoretical physicist that's any good knows six or seven different theoretical representations for exactly the same physics, and our knows that the truth that they're all equivalent, but he keeps them in his head hoping that they'll give him different ideas for guessing. Okay, so this uh, particular clip seems uh, very, very interesting and fascinating and relevant to everything we're talking about, and perhaps to all of science. Uh, can you comment on it? Uh, well, first, first that, can you comment on the clip? It's important to understand what science uh, is about, uh, and in particular physics. You know, I'm a physicist, and people think, well, um, you, you have these uh, theories of physics, 
uh, and then you change your mind. You come up with another theory, and this is, science is totally unreliable. Um, uh, these are just conjectures. And uh, what people often cite is Newton's theory of gravitation. Uh, this was supposed to be the be-all and end-all. It would explain gravitation. And then along came Einstein, and, uh, and people think, well, that proved Newton's theory wrong. Um, this is to completely misunderstand the nature of, of science, that um, science is about describing the world in the most reliable way. It's really not about reality. It's about our, um, our understanding or observations of reality. It's not about reality itself. And uh, Newton's theory is perfectly good to, uh, to send a spacecraft to the moon, um, but if you want to explain a black hole, you really need uh, Einstein's theory of gravitation. And nobody I know would say that Einstein's theory is the last word. Uh, they would expect that something would come along which would be even better. That doesn't mean that Einstein was wrong or Newton was wrong, but that their theories have uh, a limited range of applicability. Uh, if you like, they're models of the world uh, which have utility. We can apply them uh, and uh, we can describe the world with greater and greater reliability. And the, the question I think that you're after is, um, is this an unending process or is it the case that our theories will get uh, better and better and better until we sort of hit on, as it were, the correct theory of everything? That is, that we will have a uh, description of the world, uh, some sort of wonderful mathematical formula you might wear on your t-shirt, for example, uh, that would encapsulate all physical phenomena uh, perfectly. That is, that every test you could make or you could conceive of, the theory and the observation would agree. Now, that's a dream some people have. Other people think it's just a pipe dream, that we will never get uh, to, to that point, and that such a theory may not even exist. Uh, and it, it's one of these things that we're never going to know, uh, because even if you have a theory uh, which has never been found to be contradicted by any experiment, uh, you can't be sure that, as Feynman said, that there isn't another theory uh, which would uh, give exactly the same results, uh, but more to the point, a theory that would give exactly the same results for those things that have been measured, but would differ in things that maybe haven't been measured. And the, the way you test new theories, it's not enough to, to uh, people write to me all the time saying, well, I've got this theory that can explain all the particles in the universe and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my answer is always, well, uh, give me an experiment that would show how your theory differs from the standard model of particle physics, and then it could be tested. If it doesn't differ, it's of no value, really, apart from, as Feynman said, if you change the conceptual framework, it might lead you to think along certain lines. And the classic example, I've already mentioned it, is the general theory of relativity. For, for Newton, a gravitation was a force of attraction between particles across uh, empty space. For Einstein, gravitation is a warping of the geometry of space-time. Uh, so these are two completely different, it's not a force, two, two completely different ways of looking at the same phenomenon. Uh, and by thinking in terms of warped space-time, it does lead one to, uh, to con consider things like black holes, wormholes, um, uh, gravitational lensing and things which um, uh, they do, in some ways, have a Newtonian counterpart, but you wouldn't be led to think that way. And same thing with, with quantum physics, really. It, uh, it, it, it's not that it's just a different set of laws that apply for atoms and molecules. It's the entire conceptual framework was transformed back in the 1920s. And we now think about the micro world in a completely different manner, uh, which, which then suggests applications to other areas of science. Um, so th this is all part of the scientific process. And it doesn't mean, let me reiterate, that science is unreliable. That these changes that take place, these um, technical transformations, but in particular the conceptual transformations, um, just mean that our science gets more and more reliable at explaining the world. But whether there is an ultimate theory of everything, uh, you know, I'm hopeful, but but skeptical. I, we're certainly not there yet, anyway. Okay, a couple of uh, very interesting words that you've used and Feynman also used. Feynman talks about psychologically 
two equivalent theories or interpretations of physics can lead to different results. No, and you talked about the utility of, a, of an interpretation that can lead to different results. So trying to connect this to our opening conversation in terms of what's eating Europe or what's eating the human species in terms of war, in terms of an inability to manage ourselves correctly. Would you agree that an interpretation of quantum mechanics or an interpretation of physics that led us to um, rigorous responses or rigorous answers to some of the biggest open questions in other science is preferable to an interpretation that does not lead to that uh, to those breakthroughs, even if the two theories are equivalent. Does that make sense? Uh, well, what does make sense is um, the uh, the notion that uh, quantum mechanics, which was such a revolutionary way of looking at the world, developed. Uh, started in the 1920s, but developed in the 1930s, um, can be applied more broadly, not, not a, in the technical sense. There's something called Schrodinger's equation, which describes how electrons move, for example. You can't apply Schrodinger's equation to uh, uh, the stock market or you know, hu human uh, sociology, economics, or anything of that sort. You can't do that. Um, but the way of thinking uh, having to do with uh, indeterminism, but also uh, a concept called complementarity that Niels Bohr developed, which is, um, and I'll give you the example that is clear cut. Uh, people know, I think, that electrons go around uh, in atoms, go, go around the nucleus, and you might uh, wonder for a particular atom, well, where is it now? And how is it moving you know in, in its orbit and although that would be very hard to determine you sort of imagine the electron must be somewhere and must be moving in a certain way but quantum mechanics complementarity says uh, that's not true you can do uh, an experiment where you say well let's measure the position of the electron and you'll get an electron at a position you'll get a result uh, but then you can say nothing about its motion or you can say, well, I can uh, find out how it's moving, but then I can't say anything about its position, because these are complementary aspects of reality. And you, I come back to the point, you might say, well, what's, what's it really doing? Um, and is this just a limitation of the human senses? Well, quantum mechanics says, no, it's intrinsic to nature itself, that um, there are different windows into the microcosm, and depending on which one you look through, uh, so you will get one result or the other. Uh, these results are not in contradiction. Uh, they are complementary, uh, but the nature of the observation affects what uh, the outcome is. And so Niels Bohr wanted to apply this to human society, that there are complementary ways of looking. You might have some particular organizational parameter, and you could talk about that and maybe measure that and try to fine tune it, try to change it, uh, in a social experiment, or you might have some completely complementary uh, variable or, or parameter. And these would not be in contradiction. They would simply be complementary ways of looking at things. Um, I'm not sure, although that was popular in the 30s, I'm not sure that, uh, that, that social scientists would take it terribly seriously today. But it's always worth remembering that uh, the answers you get uh, depend upon the question that you ask. And when it comes to human society, there are different questions that we can ask of it. Uh, and um, and that, that, I think, is a powerful principle, which, which does apply throughout all of the sciences. OK, yeah, I think, the, I think we agree that the, the biggest question is how to keep, our, keep from destroying ourselves. I think this could be one universal uh, idea or principle that, that we can agree on that we need to keep keep alive, no? keep, keep the species in existence. That brings me to an, an, an interesting or, or something that interests me a lot um, person, per, personally and, and, and academically is the interpretation of Yakira Haranov and his idea that the present is a combination of causes that come from the future and the past 
together. And you've also done some work along these lines. Can you give us a quick summary of, of your work and Aharonov's work, if they're similar or they're different? And um, drawing special attention to the fact that these are, uh, although they sound unusual from the traditional scientific perspective, they're actually equivalent um, uh, interpretations or pictures of quantum mechanics. Is that the case? And can you can you elaborate on that? Well, I must uh, uh, berate you uh, for using the C word again, uh, causal, um, because in quantum mechanics, we can't talk about causes. We can talk about interactions. Uh, and uh, the, the whole point is that that at that level, causes are something that emerge uh, uh, on the macro scale. Now, um, I mentioned earlier that if you know anything about quantum mechanics, uh, uncertainty lies at its heart. Uh, and what does this mean? It means that you can specify in as much detail as is uh, possible, even in theory, uh, the, the state of a quantum system uh, at this one particular moment might be an electron, for example. How is it moving? What can you say? about what it will be doing in five minutes' time, uh, assuming there's no interactions with it, it just does its own thing. And quantum mechanics says, well, you can't. Uh, you can't give a definite answer. If you know um, the United States now, there are many, many possible futures that it can follow. That's the basic idea of quantum uncertainty. Uh, but uncertainty works both ways in time. If you say, well, what was it doing five minutes ago? Uh, there are many possible histories. Uh, and uh, Aronoff has um, drawn attention to that. There's nothing contentious about this by saying, well, um, you can specify an initial condition. You can create an electron moving in a certain way or set up an atom with a certain, in a certain state. Um, but because of quantum uncertainty, we can also think of a final, uh, selecting a final state. Now, we're, we're not free to do that. If you create an atom in a certain state now, you can't will it to be in a particular state in five minutes' time. But if you uh, set up a million atoms in identical states now, you know that some fraction of them in five minutes' time will satisfy the final boundary conditions. And so there's a subset of that ensemble of identical systems that will satisfy both an initial and a final boundary condition. That's uncontentious. And then the question is, what can you say about that subset, about what happens in the middle. Because you pin down the beginning, you pin down the end, what about in the middle? Uh, how could we find that out? That's one of the features of quantum mechanics, that if you make a measurement of something, you mess it up. Uh, the term, technical terms, you collapse the wave function. Some people don't like that, that term. But uh, the, the point is that the, it, that the measurement irreversibly uh, alters the, uh, the path, the quantum pathway. Uh, and so if you, if you try to intervene uh, partway between the beginning and the end, well, then you you were, you've messed everything up. Uh, but uh, Aronoff drew attention to the fact many years ago uh, that uh, if you turn down the interaction between the measuring apparatus and the measured system enough, that is, if the measurement becomes ever more gentle, then the back, back reaction on the quantum system becomes less and less and less. Uh, and if you've got a million uh, samples and a subset of those satisfies both conditions and you perform very gentle measurements, uh, then you can take a statistical average over those measurements and you can say something about what's going on between the beginning and the end. This is not in contradiction to uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, uh, but it does provide a new insight uh, into the way that quantum systems work. It is just standard quantum mechanics, but as you uh, have been at pains to point out with Feynman and so on, it's another interpretation. Uh, well, it's even that is a loaded term. Um, it, it is standard quantum mechanics, but it's another way of packaging it uh, to look at a different set of things that you can measure and have been measured. And these, these experiments have been done and the predictions are correct. Uh, Aronoff is right. I've worked with him. We've written uh, a paper together, uh, and I've been interested in these things for some years. Um, some people think, well, this is nothing more than a recasting of familiar quantum mechanics, and there's no big deal. 
other people think, well, no, this is an important way to reformulate. And I can tell you why I think it's important, because um, really I'm a cosmologist. And so you have to ask, well, um, you know, whoever um, set up the initial conditions of the universe in the Big Bang, there was a, a quantum state. We like to think it was a simple quantum state. Um, uh, supposing we now say, well, what will the final conditions of the universe be? That could be a di rather different quantum state. And then what can this, these weak measurements tell us about our observations in, in between the beginning and the end? And, and, and is it meaningful to talk about uh, getting over this prejudice that we feel that somehow the initial conditions ought to be set, but the final conditions will, you know, whatever happens will happen? Um, wh why do we think that? Why should we not have a final condition and an initial condition? And mostly, uh, they, they won't meet in the middle in any neat way. And so then the question is, uh, would we know? Is there, is there any observation we can carry out which would betray the fact that the universe is constrained at both the beginning and the end? So I think it does have cosmological implications, but in terms of, you know, in the lab, um, some people think there could be commercial applications of these weak measurements, uh, amplifying tiny quantities and so on. Um, that remains an open question, but I think it's a really interesting way of looking at the world. Well, I agree with you. I think it's super interesting. In fact, I, I think it's going back to our first original question in, in, in terms of what's eating Europe and what's eating the universe. If, in fact, the cosmic wave, cosmic microwave background is an indication of what's, what's, um, uh, a certain set of conditions in the early universe, then there is something that it, that's that we're experiencing now and that we'll experience in the future that helps to understand that, right? The um, the cold the batch that you that you named your book after. So um, let me turn this now to the question of. If in fact there is a future boundary condition to the universe and Aharonov and his team have made some, I think, in, very interesting theoretical um, advances in this regard. If in fact there is a, a future boundary condition and if we merge this with your uh, various ideas regarding the far future of humanity, the far future evolution of humanity and artificial intelligence, uh, can you connect those two ideas? You say that artificial intelligence, we're on the verge of a, of a, a, a true advances in artificial intelligence and in the far future, this artificial intelligence will take on a life of its own in some sense that we will not be able to understand it. And that lies in the future at some point. Does that, that concept of an artificial intelligence that evolves by itself into the future, that's causing a, a not causing, forgive me, you, you have, you have uh, castigated me for using cause several well, times. You, you can use it when we're talking about the macroscopic world, the everyday world, Ca causation is fine. It's an important concept, but it just doesn't work okay. at the atomic level. Fantastic. So that, that future um, uh, universe that you're talking about where AI is super advanced and it's, really outside of our ability to comprehend its decisions. And that coupled with the idea that there's two boundary conditions that explain the present time. Can you comment on that? It seems that there's a, there's a merging of the concept of, of, that comes from religion, the concept of God, right? Who knows everything and somehow is, either guiding the universe or has caused the universe or has brought it into being, but in, in the future through artificial intelligence. And it's that that's having an impact on what's eating Europe today and what's eating the universe in terms of the cosmic microwave background. Does any of this make sense to you? <laughs> well, you're connecting a lot of uh, rather different concepts together there. Um, uh, and I'm not sure, uh, uh, that I can see the, the linkage, uh, but I can make a few general comments that one of these uh, is 
the first and obvious point that, that a lot of people are scared about the future of artificial intelligence. Uh, but a colleague of mine remarked that he's more concerned about human stupidity than artificial intelligence. Uh, and, uh, that, and I think in the near future, uh, AIs are only going to improve the human condition. But there is a deep technical and ethical problem that I, if we imagine the, the far future, a million years or something, in which all of the intellectual heavy lifting will be done by um, machines, I think, uh, and I don't even like the word machines, I mean designed intelligence as opposed to evolved intelligence. Um, I don't know what we call these things. Uh, but um, if we imagine that far future, we would like to think, uh, you know, is that bad? It may be sort of scary, uh, but a lot of things about technology are scary. Uh, but is it actually bad? Uh, and everyone uh, would agree uh, that we would like to embed human values, but only the better human values, uh, into these designed systems. And uh, I live here in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and it's one of the places where there's been a lot of experiments with self-driving cars. So here we have artificial intelligence. And the people that uh, program these vehicles uh, need to, uh, in a rudimentary way, embed something about human values. And there's, there's a very famous philosophical problem which uh, translated into self-driving cars. Uh, do you, does the car swerve to avoid a, a baby uh, crossing uh, it w with mother in, in a, a stroller um, and hit uh, you know, five old people on the sidewalk? Uh, is that the right decision to make? Uh, and, you know, we would, we would all struggle with making that decision. Um, and so these sorts of, uh, you know, ethical issues are already intruding into the way we program. But I want to take a much more futuristic view. That what do we do about the fact that we are designing the first generation of AIs? But the next generation will be designed by those AIs. And the one after that, you know, by, by the next generation. And so it will go on. Uh, and then it becomes a technical question. Can we embed human values, uh, however we, we want to agree on them, uh, in perpetuity uh, f for millions or billions of years? Once we unleash into the universe uh, this uh, self-sustaining uh, artificial intelligence uh, ecosphere, uh, will, will it eventually leave behind all the things that we hold dear? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. We uh, would like to think uh, that somehow uh, AI, uh, even if it, it develops its own ethical system, will be an improvement on, uh, on Homo sapiens. Uh, but we don't know. There's no theorem to say that. So it's a step into the unknown. But to, to connect with something else you said, there's no doubt that after a period of, I would think, only a few thousand years, uh, that these AIs will have godlike capabilities uh, and would have a relationship to humanity if we still exist, we haven't destroyed ourselves, would have a relationship very similar to those uh, 2,000 years ago that people imagined that God or gods would have to humanity. They were, in effect, the, the, the sort of beings who uh, we can project AIs will be in, uh, you know, maybe as little as a few hundred years, I don't know, but definitely godlike capabilities. Uh, that's not to, to say we're talking about the creator of the universe or the architect of the universe or anything on that grand scale. But certainly, uh, by uh, human standards, uh, we'd be, we would be dealing with gods uh, with these entities. Okay, Professor, um, we're running out of time. I would have liked to ask you a lot more about symmetry and, and about your book. Your book does not uh, talk too much about symmetry. It's implied as a kind of a, a final final question or comment, can you um, elaborate on the implicit role that, or can you be more explicit about the role symmetry has played through the big questions that you ask in your book? Oh, uh, well, there is uh, very definitely a chapter on uh, symmetry because it deals with the question about where does matter come from? Uh, and in the lab, we can make matter, for example, at uh, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, uh, you make particles. But when you do that, you always make 
same number of antiparticles. There's a symmetry between matter and antimatter. Okay. What are, uh, what are antiparticles? Well, uh, we know about the electron. There's a, a sort of mirror image particle called the positron, which is, uh, has the same mass as the electron, but a positive electric charge. And if the two come together, they explode and cancel each other out and uh, just turn into photons. Uh, so somehow the universe, when the Big Bang went bang, made uh, only matter and not antimatter. Something broke that symmetry. And we don't really know what, but there are plenty of ideas around, plenty of models that people have, have looked at, but nothing has quite nailed it at the moment. So that symmetry has been broken. And had it not been broken, we wouldn't be here discussing it. Uh, and the symmetry between matter and antimatter connects with some other symmetries that are very familiar. Uh, one of these uh, is the symmetry between left and right. Uh, and we all know that, you know, in a mirror you reverse left and, and right. Uh, and you might think that the laws of physics would be indifferent as to left-handedness or right-handedness. But there are particles, uh, fundamental particles have, have a property called spin, they're spinning, and of course they spin in a, with a certain handedness, uh, and uh, it turns out that the weak nuclear force uh, breaks the symmetry between left-handedness and right-handedness. came to great shock in 1956 that that was the case. So another example of a symmetry break. And then one that is dear to my heart is the symmetry between forward in time and backward in time. And we've sort of been touching on that topic a bit in our conversation. Uh, and, um, and again, you think the laws of physics wouldn't care, time forward, time backward. So i give you an everyday example. Uh, the, the Earth is going around the Sun, viewed from a particular uh, perspective. You'd say it's going clockwise around the Sun. Um, uh, could it go anti-clockwise around the Sun? Well, absolutely. There's nothing in the laws of physics to say it's got to go clockwise and couldn't go anti-clockwise. It could be reversed. Um, and this uh, seems to be true of pretty much all of physics, that if there's any particular process, then its reverse process uh, is allowed. You might think, well, in daily life, that doesn't seem true. Rivers don't flow uphill. Um, but that's because these are statistical effects. We're back to causation and all that. But at the microscopic level, down the atomic level, time forward, time backward are, um, are symmetries. But once again, there's a very tiny effect that breaks that symmetry. Uh, and uh, what is really fascinating, I think, is that the uh, left-right symmetry and the time forward time reverse symmetry connects up with this matter antimatter symmetry uh, in a in a very deep way uh, and so these are really important aspects of trying to understand the fundamental nature of, of matter um, there, there's another aspect that uh, i refer to in the book um, where symmetry comes in but probably uh, you're right that it uh, it's implicit rather than explicit which is i've mentioned that the big bang was um, almost completely uniform. The universe started out in this very bland state, but now, of course, it's much more complex. How do we understand this arrow of complexity? Well, one way is through symmetry breaking. That uh, if, you, if you take a completely uniform gas, of course, it's totally symmetric. Uh, if you take um, uh, instead a picture of a galaxy with all its internal complexity, all those, those symmetries have been broken. Uh, and there are mechanisms, uh, we call it spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, mechanisms to do this. I'll give you a very simple example. If you um, hold a pencil up on its tip, um, it's in a symmetric state as far as the horizontal rotations in the horizontal plane are concerned. But it's unstable, and let go of it, and the pencil will topple, and it'll fall in a particular direction. And you might say, well, why did it pick that direction rather than any other? There's no, no significance to the direction it picked. It's just spontaneously broken the symmetry. And physics is full of systems that undergo those spontaneous symmetry breaks. And every time a symmetry breaks, you get more complexity. So part of this complex arrow of time, which I was talking about earlier, is a succession of symmetry breaks. And there's always a possibility that there'll be another catastrophic symmetry break, something that will cause the collapse of space-time or will cause a bubble of some other type of quantum vacuum uh, to uh, be nucleated at one part of the universe and spread out at the speed of light and eat the universe from the inside out. That's another 
theme that I deal with in the book. A number of ways in which um, the universe can be eaten. It can be eaten, gobbled up from outside, eaten, eating itself inside out. We know uh, that just at the level of black holes, they're eating matter in their vicinity, but it's, they're not eating space-time. Uh, but there are even uh, theories of physics in which space itself can be eaten, a bit like a Swiss cheese, where the uh, cheese is space and the holes are bubbles of no space. And, uh, uh, and we can even work out you know, what would happen to the universe if it was being devoured by bubbles of no space. Would this carry on until there's no space left? And that's one way the universe could end. Uh, so these gloomy things uh, make it into the book because um, there's a whole variety of discussion about the ways that the universe might end, big bang, big crunch, big rip, uh, eaten from the inside out, and eaten from the outside in. Um, you can see I'm smiling because all of these things really are fun to think about, highly conjectural, all possible ways the universe will end. Um, but most of them, not all of them, most of them refer to the very far uh, future. So uh, I personally am not losing too much sleep over it. I'm much more worried about the situation in Ukraine to come back to our, our opening uh, discussion. Well, fascinating. Uh... Professor, thank you so much. I hope everybody will will buy a copy of the book because I think it's it's a a very simple, enjoyable read. It's a uh, fascinating, uh, concise summary of of where we are and what we still don't know. We could have gone on for a long time about this with your work on the DS uh, space and D, especially the DS DS correspondence and the symmetry and some of the symmetries that are. A, apparently emerging in terms of the way uh, animal brains process information and the way information is processed in the cosmos itself through the ADS correspondence and the, and the DSDS correspondence. Are you aware of the work that uh, Eva Silverstein is doing on the DSDS correspondence, by the way? Uh, yes, in, in general terms, I am. And, uh, and I do know Fascinating. Well, I won't take any more of your time, Professor. Uh, you've been very, very generous. Thank you so much. I wish you the best of luck. And where can people buy your book? Uh, uh, obviously online. And anywhere else they can buy your book? Uh, well, uh, it, it, when I began uh, writing uh, popular books, I'd say, well, you know, have you tried a bookshop? <laughs> Go to your <laughs> local bookshop. But uh, bookshops are pretty rare these days. Uh, and so obviously you can order it online. You can also order directly from the publisher which is uh, in the United States, uh, it's University of Chicago Press. In Britain, it's uh, Penguin, uh, Alan Lane, the Penguin Press. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there are still some places uh, where, where there are bookshops. And, uh, and if, if, like me, our uh, listeners uh, are d devoted to, uh, to books and like to browse around bookshops, then uh, that's, that's a great thing to do. Go and browse around your local bookshop if it exists, and then I'll ask about my book and, uh, and suggest that they buy some more stock. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. I, say, uh, I did a, an event the other night, and uh, a public event, and the bookshop, there is a local bookshop, they were there, sold out the entire stock. Um, I signed uh, copies, of course, uh, but uh, did, didn't buy enough stock. So, so bookshops Fantastic. do exist, and they will get stock. <laughs> okay. Well, congratulations on, on your excellent career. Uh, your, the courage that you've had to, to ask these, these uh, sometimes non-mainstream questions and confront the, your critics has been a real source of inspiration. So thank you so much for that. And thanks again for your time today, Professor. Well, uh, thank you uh, also for your interest uh, in, in this book and in my career. It's been a fun conversation. Thank you.